Let's see. I think we're on. So um, hey there, everybody. Today we've got an uh, interesting new live stream format. I'm joined here with uh, Ronnie Romance. And Ron, what are we talking about today? <laughs> oh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Welcome to my yacht uh, in Long Island Sound. <laughs> it's great out here. <laughs> we are talking today about the current state of the um, local bicycle store and uh, um, what it's like in America right now. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, hearsay out there, so we're, we're we want to go to go, the source. Go to the source. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but before we get started, where are the where are the fireplaces on the boat? Is it on the? Yeah, it's there's there's the actually six on this six. boat. Yeah, on this <laughs> yacht. Excuse me. There's six, but um, it's a little windy today, and it blew out. You know, so we're just uh, <laughs> hanging out in the hot tub. We're gonna go. If yeah, I think when uh, my, yeah, back there. I think when Ron and I were spitballing, we were going to add the idea of calling it between two fireplaces. <laughs> uh, but I couldn't get my green screen up in time. So we'll, we'll just go with uh, Russ and Ron for now. <laughs> next time, there's going to be multiple fireplaces for sure. That's true. Yeah, yeah, we promise. Come back next time if you're looking for a fireplace. We'll promise we'll be a little bit better prepared. <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, let's uh, bring on our guest, uh, Kyle Kelly. Welcome to the live stream. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to assume a lot of people that watch um, both our channels um, are probably familiar with you and GSC, but if, if they're not, can you just give us a quick background? Yeah. Um, Golden Saddle Cyclery opened in 2011. Um, my two partners were Ty Hathaway and uh, Thomas Wood. Uh, Woody actually left kind of early on, like in the first four years. He's working at Speedwagon now. Um, yep. doing a lot of awesome stuff up in Portland. Um, Ty was doing a lot of stuff with Specialized, uh, but he was recently part of all those cuts. Um, yeah, Golden South Psych 3 was going on 12 years, uh, but we closed our doors uh, at the end of November hmm. this year or last year. I don't even know what year it is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Are we even going COVID year years? four or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is an epoch. <laughs> but Golden South Cycle was located in Los Angeles, California. For those of y'all that didn't know, um, it was kind of the world's most famous local bike shop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I concur. I, I Before I had ever... I'm thinking, you know, probably about a decade ago, I started going, visiting Golden Saddle. Um, mm -hmm. I would visit my, uh, one of my high school friends in Van Nuys. Shout out to Van Nuys, everybody. Big Van Nuys, <laughs> right here. <laughs> and I would ride the LA bike path. Or sometimes I'd take, I'd take the public transit over to Golden Saddle because I knew I could, I could have somebody to hang out with over there and be seen. You know, maybe Kyle would take a picture of me. There you, you go. Know, if you're lucky. Put it on, put you, it got on a, you got a lot of early photos for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like Sean, I remember Sean was there one time, Sean talking to him from mm -hmm. Team Dream. Yeah. And I think he photographed his shirt on you. That's right. That's right. right? Laying uh, yeah, on the sidewalk. Yeah. I used to love, I instantly connected with Sean talking about vintage mountain bike parts and things like that. Him and I would just sit at the front table there and talk for what seemed like hours. Probably was hours. And Probably you, was hours. And you tried to get me to drink clubs, but of course I wouldn't. <laughs> I think I was maybe the only person that would say you no the, and you wouldn't peer pressure me. So that was a nice start. Yeah. You're the only person that, you're the only person that ever said no, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, it's just your golden saddle has always had kind of this bigger than life personality. Um, and uh, you've always had incredible personalities working there also. And um, the party attached with it. And I've always thought of it as like a, um, especially 10 years ago uh, upon first visiting, I was like, wow, this is a different bicycle shop model, right? It's completely different than most of the um, let's say mainstream bike shops that I had been into prior to that. Um, yeah. You know, and, and there's something about it that just made it completely special. And I think that that it also uh, was like, what, the perfect time in um, Instagram uh, <laughs> timelines, right? You know, it was, was kind of everything happened at once. How did, how, how do you think it all kind of came together like that? How did you, how did it get to be the cool bike shop? So cool on. I mean, you know, I was running a, a website before that called Trackosaurus Rex. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I had a very large following. So that probably had a lot to do with it. Um, at that point, John was coming to Los Angeles a lot. So he was there quite a bit. 
It was John um, Watson, you, John Pro. Yeah. It was John Prawley back. John Prawley right? back yeah. then. Mm -hmm. um, then Instagram happened, and this is crazy because my parents made me get on Instagram so they could see what I was doing in life. <laughs> they were like, we're like, you don't talk to us anymore. We don't see anything. Mm -hmm. There's this new thing where you can like just take a photo and share it. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wait, what? So I, I did it. And yeah, then it was just like, whoa, this is crazy. And then all of a sudden I saw you taking photos of people riding down tree trunks. And I was just like, <laughs> I like I know the picture. <laughs> this could be really, this could be really cool. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's like a blog, but it just wasn't as much work. I didn't have to resize <laughs> the photo, you know, it didn't need as many words. All right. And now it's more work than a blog. It is <laughs> my hands hurt. You know, I'm like trying to get an iPad with a keyboard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Use my uh, brakes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you know everything. Obviously, all this, all the like stars and moons aligned, mm -hmm. and it worked out that way, you know. But the biggest, the biggest kind of boom I've seen at GSC was in the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, kind of whenever I just gave the reins to everyone there. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I'm very conservative when it came to spending money at the bike shop. And like, mm -hmm. as soon as I gave Jimmy a credit card, shit hit the fan, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and as long as I was taking care of it, you know, it was great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more stuff in there, the more cool stuff in there, mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of like snowballed yeah. and it made me realize like, oh, they're you can have a bike shop. It just has to sell everything that you can't get on Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of, that was kind of like a big eye opener whenever I let everyone just start spending money on things that they wanted to see in there and, you know, giving GSC the personality of everyone and not just me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, speaking of bike shops, we've got a, a ton of uh, bike shops from all over the country tuning in um, on the comments section, which is pretty rad. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear uh, other people's uh, experiences around the country. Of course, yeah. I, I didn't even I didn't even know you could click on the comments. Oh this yeah, we got we got sun and air right now. <laughs> all up in here. Holy cow! Uh, CNL from Montreal. Um, I saw Jared from Hope was in here. Yeah, yeah, of course. Hey, Jared. <laughs> uh, well, uh, one thing I will say, Ace is in the comments right now. And, we, <laughs> and Ace has a lot to do with early GSC. Mm -hmm. um, he made every single video we were putting out back then. Uh, okay. We were putting out a video a month, probably. If you go look at the Golden South Cyclery Vimeo, it's pretty outstanding. And then you can also go look at Ace's Vimeo. And there's even some stuff on there that's not on the Golden Saddle Vimeo, but we made some unbelievable videos with Ace. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember those early videos, and that really like caught my attention because a lot of the bike shops weren't, you know, it's just not what the the what shops did. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just a real creative uh, amalgam of different things that came together to make Golden Saddle, I suppose, in the beginning. And as you were touching on earlier. You, you think you had a lot of employees that just had good taste. Yeah. Is that what it comes <laughs> down to? Is, I, is, is that what makes a bike shop stand out early on? Do you think? I think, uh, yeah, I think people with good taste will obviously make something stand out. Um, but I think I was just turned GSC into a physical blog, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like GSC was a physical Pinterest of cycling. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you could go in mm -hmm. there and you could see the people even you, you could see you, you were there. Right? <laughs> you, know, like you could see the people, you could see the things, right. you could see these things that no one was seeing mm -hmm. besides on the internet, you know? Mm -hmm. So why would you not want to be in this physical space? This is, you know, you would make pilgrimages someplace if it had everything you wanted to see in one place. People do this all the time for everything else, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what, you know, was created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I know, Russ, we had to type down some questions. Do we want to start just just wrapping them off and go there? I don't want to get too far off of – I don't have them in front of me. I don't want to get too oh, far yeah. off base because I could definitely uh, do that. 
Yeah. So, I mean, how, like, uh, you, you, you own the shop, now you're kind of out of it, but you've seen how different organic things helped it grow. How much of that do you think is replicable by other bike shops? Or is it really just a matter of like stars lining, getting the right employees and staff? I think, I mean, your, your staff is definitely the most important thing that you can ever have at a bike shop. Uh, you know, you have to have people that ride bikes, number one, you know, because if people don't ride bikes, then, you know, it's just a job. It's like you work in a J crew, you know? <laughs> so I, number one is the employees, you know, you got to find kind people, you know, polite people. Sometimes they can be grumpy. David was, David was grumpy, but that's good. <laughs> David, <laughs> David is at Hope Cyclery, who mm -hmm. I think Hope Cyclery is on right now. I don't know yeah. if it's Jared and David or both, but uh, someone from Hope Cyclery is on. David has fantastic. Uh, speaking of taste, David has fantastic. David has unbelievable taste in everything. Mm -hmm. Which sometimes you know, makes you grumpy. Yeah, it does. Because you see the world that has the worst taste. And you see that and you're just like, why? Why do these people have this taste? Right, right. But right. I think, yeah, employees are the most important thing. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. um, GSC, you, I feel like I could replicate GSC again, no problems. Um, because it, it wasn't just this, obviously the stars aligned with the Instagram thing and that kind of fame, you know, but it's, Knowing, you know, this last 11, 12 years, I learned so much being there almost every day, you know, it, it was crazy. But the thing is, like, I think the biggest thing I took away from GSC closing was no matter who you are, how much influence you have, how popular you are, how much a community loves you, anything can be taken away from you at any moment. Mm -hmm. you know so if you are holding on to this thing like it's your identity you probably shouldn't um because very much golden south cyclery became my identity for so long and it was taken away from me um and had i known that this was even a possibility you know i probably would have you know made a, some different moves down the line right and of course, when you say taken taken away from you, what do you mean by that? Uh, okay, so if, if people don't know, Golden South Cyclery closed um, because our building was sold um, to a development company who's doing a boutique hotel next to us, mm. and they needed Golden South Cyclery for storage while doing construction. Mm. For storage, yeah. <laughs> and then as for the as for the brand. Uh, none of us ever really thought Golden South Cyclery was anything but a time and a place. So once you removed the bike shop from that store with that unique alleyway, mm -hmm. it we we all just agreed that it was it was over. Mm -hmm. You know, did you guys do like scramble to to find another property at first, and then we're like, we, well, we looked at we looked at first, and then it was really kind of like. Everyone just was, everyone just didn't know what the future had in store for any of us. So I think, I think a lot of the employees, you know, felt, felt scared to take GSC over with no space, you know, no this, no that. Um, and then it was just like, if we don't, if we don't have this space, then GSC is just nothing. So you couldn't, you can't sell something that's nothing, you know, so it was just time to, you know, for all of us to go start over. Right. And what does it feel like to start over or to even be, did you have a good gauge on what it was like? I don't know. Um, well, you were saying that you saw the most amount of growth in GSC in the last three years. I think that that's pretty indicative of the rest of the bicycle, um, the bicycle shop sphere also, if I'm not mistaken. What well, I don't even mean growth in like money, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, growth in emotion and, you know, employees talking to each other about mm -hmm. how they feel, you know, for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. Cause that's another thing with bike shops, bike shop employees don't talk about how they feel with other bike shop employees. So you get these huge rifts in bike shops, you yeah. know, <laughs> and 
It's just like, <laughs> I'm talking like real growth. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we all became adults in the last three years <laughs> and it was unbelievable to be running a bike shop with all adults, you know, being mm, right. responsible and taking care of things, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now was some of this because you guys were feeling busier than usual also? Was it like an added stress of, of uh, what the, the supposed brief bike boom or was it um, no, hyper concentrated? What was the I experience was, the last three years? There? I think it was me having a child and having to mm -hmm. step away a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and having, I had to give, you know, more responsibility mm -hmm. to everyone at the bike shop. You know, Jaime has always been my right hand man. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of y'all know him as Jimmy. He, since the day he started at Golden South Cyclery, um, he literally has taken care of everything I could not take care of, you know, unbelievable. And it just wasn't fair to him to have so much pressure. You know, a lot of that pressure he gave to himself. He was a self-declared manager, like within months of him starting there. He like <laughs> called Brooks for an interview. He called Brooks. He was like, hey, we all interview me. I'm the manager of Golden Cell Cyclery. He got there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there for that one. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, so but then him and I were giving responsibility to more people at the bike shop. And it just allowed everybody, you know, a little bit more sense of what was mm -hmm. happening there. Now, a, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, Russ. How big was your staff? I think there was, I think eight, eight employees whenever we closed. Okay. Which is probably, a, I mean, most bike shops in, in America, you got two to eight employees probably. It's a pretty, I felt like you had a pretty standard sized shop there. You crammed a heck of a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> shop space yeah. in LA sure ain't cheap. <laughs> I'm so thankful. So thankful we had that much stuff yeah, in there. Yeah. We can sell it all to be able to get out of debt before we close. <laughs> <laughs> Yours was the kind of shop that I, you know, I worked in shops when I was in high school. And after that, once suspension came around, once suspension and yeah, suspension really, once suspension went from elastomer to oil in spring. I couldn't figure it. I couldn't work on bikes anymore. <laughs> and so I was basically unemployable after that. And, uh, and so I would, I would do terrible things to my bikes that would just make every other, every mechanic just cringe, you know? And so I, I had a real bad reputation if a mechanic saw me and I've always worked on my own bikes and still do to this day. I just have to keep them to a certain simplicity so that I can make sure I can fix them on the trail or something. We all know this about me, but you know, I always felt like going into bike shops, um, for me, before before Instagram, before Ultra Romance on Instagram, I would get vibed out like everywhere I went. It was like a it was like a really like um, yeah, a really like anxiety ridden experience going into a bike shop. And I'm a white guy, you know, like I have everything going for me going into that bike shop. A, a lifelong cyclist walking in here, it, walk into a shop and just get totally vibed, you know, just hard. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck bike shops, man. Like, what do they do? Well, how do they? Why do they? you know what do they expect you know <laughs> and you, know, you have that trope of the curmudgeon mechanic in the back and the salesperson up front who likes probably looking down at a magazine or down at their phone nowadays and you go in and and you've got to like figure out navigate this world and it's it's i think about people going in there for the first time getting sold the wrong stuff like just having i don't know just having bad experiences that could certainly hinder them being becoming lifelong cyclists and having it become their lifestyle. Right. And I always felt that a shop like golden saddle, when I would go in there, it always felt warm and inviting. And I'm sure other, some people definitely have been vibed out of golden saddle. Let's be honest, but, sure. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, you but can't no you question. can't win them all. You can't win them all. But I loved seeing the community aspect of like what you brought to you know, it was, there was so community focused and community driven. And I was like, this is the bike shop model. Like, this is what it's got to be. Like, you know, it's got to, it, it can't just be a sh like a, like a shop where you hit the open sign and people come in and do their thing. Like it has to be so much more. Right. And so I think a lot of bike shops are still operating, especially 10 years ago under that, um, you know, we're going to have our, our treks, our specialized 
and our Pearl Izumi or whatever. And we're going to like, this is, it's, it's very rigid and we, we, we abide by all the sales manuals and, you know, we, there's not much personality in the shop. You come in, maybe you're, you know, you buy a few things, but it's not like, it's not, it doesn't become like your lifestyle. Right. And I always felt like you brought so many people into the shop that weren't even interested in riding. They were just hanging out because it was just a, a great place to meet people, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I wonder like how, you know, with how many bike shops changed, um, like I witnessed in the last 10, 15 years, like a big shift from, and like the QBP model being, um, being in uh, uh, the QBP model approach to bike shops where they're not necessarily like carrying big, like specialized Trek brands or whatever. They can carry like all the Q brands and whatnot and how that kind of, um, it, at first it made shops like new and exciting because it was like this different experience. Like you could see like Surly's in all cities or whatever, but then like, I feel like now that's kind of, uh, re homogenized shops and they're kind of dealing with, Oh, well, what do we do now? And at the precipice of what's happening with e-bikes and, and how difficult it is to work on all of the new bikes that come out, you know, every single successive year, like what, I don't know if you had say hypothetically golden saddle was able to continue what were did you even stop and did you even have a chance to really stop and think about what the future of your shop would look like <laughs> especially in los angeles where everyone has the you know the newest stuff yeah i actually had to do a year ago i had to really sit down and rethink a lot of things because we got in this situation to where our building was bought they gave us a two-year lease, but the lease, you know, they they increased our rent, and we were now we were we were well out of our budget. We were we were just working in the red all the time, starting a year ago. You know, mm -hmm. and that's why we were in debt when we closed the shop, sold everything, not in debt anymore, luckily. But you know, yeah, I said I had to really think about it, um, and you know, one thing I will say is. I, I'm not really a believer in the support your local bike shop sticker anymore, you know, because mm, um, not all local bike shops are good. Right. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah. a firm believer mm -hmm. in the support good bike shops. Right. And, you know, if, if you really want to see a place survive, you have to support them. Um, and, you know, don't support someplace that's not supporting you. And that was one thing we always tried to do at GSC is get people on the right bike that they would fall in love with riding and then they're going to spend money with you the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like mm -hmm. if you treat these people right the first time, you know, bikes are a no brainer, you know, it's, it's childish joy brought to adults. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have, everything is going to happen right when you're on that bike because you are channeling childish joy. So I was just like, well, why aren't people being, you know, selling people the right bikes, being nice to people because that's, that's a no-brainer. You have a customer for life then. Um, mm -hmm. you know. But a lot of bike shops aren't that. And your local bike shop a lot of times isn't that. And I don't think you should support that bike shop. You know, I Like I said, I'm not – I don't support the local bike shop sticker anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I think you've got to support good bike shops. And if that means ordering something from a good bike shop online, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Um but the one thing is, you know, people, people don't understand this, you know, how these things work, but like you ordering a set of Sharpies from Amazon will put your bike shop out of business, your local bike shop, good bike shop out of business. Um, just ordering anything from Amazon, Walmart, you know, that will put a bike shop out of business, even if you're not buying a bike part, um, because that just is a slippery slope. And the thing is, if people want to see these spaces survive, they have to support them. They have to spend their money there, even if it is more expensive. You know, if you're mm -hmm. not in a place where you can spend that kind of money, buy used, buy on eBay, you know, buy from individuals that are selling things on eBay because they need the money too, you know. Um, but so I very much was in, in the works of doing more of a web store with Golden South Psych 3. Um, so these 50,000 people on Instagram who say they support us could actually support us if, you know, they wanted to kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that is, I think that's super important because if you don't, if you don't stay with the times, I think you're just going to be, you know, run over by Trek, Specialized, all of these, you know, companies buying bike shops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so one of the the big things that get tattered a lot is, uh, you know, the whole building community aspect of a bike shop is that something that can actually be engineered and monetized and how do you measure the value in in community building oh it's so funny because you know i i've never used the word community with golden south Cycle 3 ever you know when i'm talking about golden south Cycle 3 um because the community had nothing to do with me you know mm-hmm. it had to do with you know the coolest thing about golden saddle was me introducing people to other people and them creating things, you know, so many things have been created just because of that alleyway, you know, with people starting all kinds of stuff, you know, Uh, other bike shops have been started, Uh, group rides have been started, you know, it's it's unbelievable. But the Mm -hmm. thing is like that word community is like the word adventure. It's like the word epic, you know, I see it now and it makes me cringe because Mm -hmm. it's just like, you actually understand this. And this comes back to, do you shop on Amazon? If you shop on Amazon, you don't actually understand what the word community means. Um, You know, one of my biggest things is you have to support your friends. Um, If if your friend works at Zip, you should be buying Zip handlebars. You know, (laughs) if your friend works at Neato, you should be buying Neato handlebars. You Choose your friend wisely. (laughs) I know, I know. Narrow, narrow bars. I'm from Indiana and I can't even ride zip bars. That's why I don't know. Zip bars. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, that's the thing. It's like people. The most important thing about community is supporting your friends. So Mm -hmm. if if someone comes into your bike shop and spending money with you, find out what they do. Go spend money with them. You Mm -hmm. know. Don't mm. hire designers that are the latest and greatest in, you know, the all bike shop world. Hire your friends, you know, that are doing the same work for you. You know, it, that way the pot just gets bigger, not deeper for people, you know. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah, I like that. It's a, that is a it just scratching each other's backs for life. That's what it's I about. Mean, everybody <laughs> has a friend who makes mm. Prince T-shirts. <laughs> so if your bike shop isn't using that friend to print their t-shirts that blows my mind you know because mm-hmm. like why would they come to your bike shop and spend money with you if you're not having them print your t-shirts mm-hmm. you know and th- there's a lot of bike shops you know there's a lot of you know people making t-shirts so there's probably a different t-shirt person for every bike shop <laughs> you know I, that's just it's so crazy to me that People want to use the word community and they shop on Amazon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like Kyle hates Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You know, it, it sucks. They put out that Grateful Dead documentary. I was like, I can't watch it. <laughs> That's big. That's big for you. That's a good documentary. I don't even I, like Grateful Dead. <laughs> yeah, it was like eight hours long. And I'm like, I can't watch it. This is like, what if I buy it? I was like, okay, maybe this time mm-hmm. if you buy it, but I can't watch it on my computer. Mm-hmm. But I'd you know, say, that's the thing is like, we really have to, you know, there's, there's so many like actual communities that have learned this and have taught this forever. Um, so like, why not be able to teach us in an alt subculture, like cycling, mm-hmm. you know, support the people that support you period dot. That's all I got to say. <laughs> and it is so much like the, like our, uh, like the difference in, and I see like a, um, but bike shops going in maybe like three different directions. I'll see if I can name three different directions, but you know, we were saying the, 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 the alt bike shop or your friend's shop that you want to support to have stuff that you can't buy on Amazon stuff that brings you in stuff that you maybe have only seen on the internet. You want to see it in person, like cool brands that they've kind of branched out and found and have a, a buyer or people with taste at the shop that want to bring these products in and, and offer them to their, uh, community for lack of a better term, Kyle, sorry. Uh, and so, and, and so you have, uh, I think that that is a big community builder because you have people who are, um, contributing, you know, and, uh, uh, bringing in th- things and new ideas and new ways of riding and just new style. It's just a cool melting pot for that. So you've got, 
I want to see more shops like that, obviously. And I think we we're definitely, I, I can, you know, there's definitely more shops like that every year. Um, and then there's the shop that the local bike shop that you don't want to support, um, which is maybe just a boring bike shop that you're not interested in for whatever reason. And then you have kind of a mixture of those two, which would be the, the, the scary future of bike shops where they're not necessarily <laughs> bike shops at all. They're, uh, you know, big box concept stores uh, where um, you've got to plug everything into a laptop to fix. And it's becoming, I, I you hear this dystopian future. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, less than five years off where you have specialized Trek Canyon. Um, they're buying up all of these local bike shops and then they're, they put in their concept stores and they've all, everybody, I mean, it's no, um, it's no secret that 80% of uh, their projected market share is in electric bicycles moving forward. And so that's where all of these big brands are putting their money. And those electric bicycles are going to have to go back to those, those bike shops to be serviced by the dealers. These bicycles can't even be serviced by, you know, your local bike shop on the corner. They're just too complex. You don't have the, they don't have the machines or the abilities or the, the skill level to fix these things or work on them. They don't even have stands that can hold these things. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> it's a, a weird thing. The problem with the electric bike world is, I mean, some of these bikes are, you can't even replace parts on them. They're so right. junky. Exactly. You know? so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's the same thing that what happened to automobiles, I suppose, where you, yeah. people, home mechanic used to be able to fix everything on it. And now it's something, try to make it so, um, you know, esoteric that you can't even, you don't even want to yeah. try. Yeah. I do think there were, were at this like crux almost, yeah, right? between yeah. like what we kind of conceive of like the traditional platonic vision of bicycle mm -hmm. and then what it's becoming. I'm actually working a video on a video on like, where's this all going to go? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, the theories I'm positing is that it could follow um, something similar to what happened to watches. Like, you know, it used to be a long time, all watches were mechanical. And then Seiko came out with the first like quartz watch. And it started this thing called the quartz crisis in the watch industry where, um, you know, all the big brands put out quartz. It was accurate. Uh, it was a little bit soulless. Um, and it almost put all of Swiss watchmaking uh, out of business. But they actually like coalesced and formed uh, this watch group to keep kind of the art of uh, mechanical watchmaking alive. And, and that's the only reason that um, uh, you know mechanical watches still exist. But if you looked at like the first quartz watch, it actually cost something like eight thousand dollars. <laughs> and now you can get it for like five bucks, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like you know this is it maybe bicycling won't fall exactly in line, but you know there are some like parallels to be learned in like other in industries that were purely mechanical and have gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, digital or, or electrified for lack of better terms. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. same thing with cameras, uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> anybody used to have, be able to have a camera repairman fix any camera that is just not it anymore. I mean, there's some, sometimes you have to send digital cameras out for months mm -hmm. to have them fixed. But yeah. I mean, the e-bike thing is just a whole nother thing, you know, and there's so many e-bike haters out there. Um, and to me, I think the e-bike is glorious. I think it's an unbelievable machine that can get people out in the mountains that couldn't do it otherwise, you know, because of health or age. Um, I think the getting rid of a car for an e-bike here in Los Angeles would save this city. Uh, it, it's so it's so hard because there's just so many shitty e-bikes out there <laughs> that have unbelievable marketing and they – got everyone in RVs buying them. And, you know, even my parents are like, what do you think about these rad bikes? I'm like, stop. <laughs> I'm like, if there's a motor attached to a wheel, hell no, don't mess with that. Yeah, I was kind of shocked to learn like how unregulated like the e-bike batteries are. Yeah. You know, there's, there's finally like, like some legislation fire. like being yeah. passed in New York after a couple of high profile mm -hmm. apartment fires. Yeah, it's all but, the stuff you don't think. Of course, you're like, of course that's happening. Of yeah. course, there's apartment <laughs> fires with these huge batteries. <laughs> uh, but we shouldn't talk about e-bikes because, no. I mean, we 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 could if you wanted to, but I think I, I think there's tons of room still for bike shops mm -hmm. to survive without without the e-bike. You know, mm -hmm. um, would I ever have a bike shop without e-bikes ever again? No, um, and it's 
it's solely because I, I sell bikes that I ride and I ride an e-bike a ton now, um, especially after having a child, after having a commute that, you know, quadru quadrupled in size. Um, and it, it really is unbelievable what you can do with a good e-bike. Uh, it's really unbelievable what you can do with a bad e-bike too. Uh, <laughs> you know, lose so money. So do you think you think the well with your own um, uh, uh, personal bias aside, do you think e-bikes are an integral component, integral part for, of bike shops moving forward? Like they've got to do e-bikes. Yes, I think I think no doubt. If if you want to be a bike shop that services, you know, a community, you have to do e-bikes because you know, communities involve families and families without e-bikes, you know, are not nearly as fun. You can have so much fun on e-bikes with your family. It's unbelievable. Hmm. Even before we had our daughter, Liz and I used to take the big easy out because it was, you didn't have to worry about parking. You could lock it up anywhere. And, you know, it was great. You know, she would be side saddled on the back. I'd be riding it. You know, we'd be going out. People would be honking like, yeah, you know, it was like it was like a tandem, but not a tandem. You know, it was, it was really cool. I, I think the, the cargo e-bike is. I, I think it's legendary already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Legend. So if, if someone, you know, wrote you a blank check, gave you a million bucks and said, hey, you know, you can start up a bike shop, however you want to do it. Like what, how would you do it differently from, or would you do, do the same thing? Uh, it would be more organized. That was one <laughs> thing about golden saddle Psych three. It was not organized and <laughs> we tried and we failed and we tried and we failed and we tried and we failed. Um, I think organization to make everyone's job easier at the bike shop is the most important thing any bike shop owner, manager, employee could ever know. You know, you have to be organized. Uh, huge shout out to Angry Catfish in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, their organization in that bike shop behind the retail area is just unbelievable. And any bike shop should aspire to be that organized. Um, just when, to make when you everyone, say organized, do you mean like an inventory or like everything? Like the, inventory like structure or I think I everything, you know. I think invoices, everything in the computer should be organized better. I think everything, you know, your inventory is the most important, obviously. Um, I think web store stuff, that kind of inventory mixed in with your regular inventory, that has to be perf perfect for that kind of system to work. I mean, everything just needs to be better organized. Hmm. You almost have to start from scratch to have that, that level of organization, huh? <laughs> you yeah, do. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you could have never, like, you could have never taken GSC, what it was, and then, like, organized it, you know? Yeah, you I couldn't, I'm to, trying to picture that. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, you would have had to, like, set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> set it on fire and then. then you know, yeah, picked up the ashes in chronological <laughs> order. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I noticed that you guys in the last couple of years really ramped up um, your the GSC branded merch. How how important did that become in terms of like sales? And is that like a strategy that you think other small bike shops um, should try to follow, like kind of converting the Instagram followers into actual like remote customers? It's funny because I think it was the opposite. I th I feel like we fell off merch wise. Um, towards the end, because we were so busy in the actual store, no one had time to ever do anything, um, you know, but I think, I think good merch that is different is it, my daughter's just yelling in the background. Can you all hear that? <laughs> Got something to say. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think all bike shops should have, you know, great merch and not for one reason, it's free advertising. So like what? You know, I mean, it's not even free advertising. You're making money off of advertising. That's crazy. That's that's like a no brainer, you know. But if you're not a good bike shop, then no one's going to buy your T-shirt. So you should just go out of business anyways. Uh, <laughs> so good bike shops can get more support. But I think the merchandise is very important. Um, I also think trying to do things that 
people aren't doing is very important. You know, like the, you know, I think when we started doing Nalgene's, very few people were doing Nalgene's. Uh, when we started doing voile straps, there was nobody doing those straps. And it's just stuff like that, you know, uh, an awareness bell. Like very few shops have their own awareness bells. And when they do, they're usually some cheap bear bell that they bought, you know, for nickels, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just they don't last. People don't want them. You can't hear them. Um, so I think it was just it was I really wanted to make products that. I didn't see in the world and that I thought the bike world needed kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, did I, I didn't even answer your question. I don't even remember what your question was. <laughs> I was asking that the importance of like merch for like a small shop, because I feel yeah, like, I think, you know, I feel like a lot of small shops, one aren't on Instagram or don't do it very well. And then they don't give an opportunity for people that want to support the brand to actually buy anything. You know, you have to. Yeah. But the thing is, those those bike shops that are good that aren't on Instagram, they still everyone who goes there loves them like they're on Instagram. You know, um, mm. they're double tapping every time they walk in that door. So if it's a good bike shop, people will, will wear that shirt. People mm. will use that water bottle um, as long as you're using a decent product, you know, like a decent a T-shirt that feels good when you put it on a, a water bottle that works and doesn't crack after two weeks kind of thing, stuff mm. like that. I always liked how you prioritized, you know, domestically made stuff in your in your merch too. I thought that was a nice, you know, because you a lot of the times when you're buying merch from shops, it's this cheap, this is not nice stuff. You yeah. Know? And so I think that that's a really important factor when you're you're putting you want to be when you you want your 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 brand and your shop to perceive to be perceived as high quality. And if you're not, if, if the stuff you're branding isn't in turn high quality then it's just lost on the customer yeah i mean that just goes it. back to supporting your friends like mm -hmm. you probably have a friend in america that you know has to do with making t-shirts mm -hmm. that is a welder that maybe is making bells maybe making bikes maybe making hats maybe making socks you know like mm -hmm. that's the thing like you know i i don't i don't know i know like three people in china you know and one of one person i know in china makes rims and i buy his rims because they're great rims, you know, I'm supporting him because he's a friend, makes great rims. You know, I also, you know, I'm down to support Velocity too, you know, that's for sure. But that's the thing is like going back to supporting your friends. Like obviously everything I've made since the Trachosaurus Rex days has been American made because those are my friends making those things. So I want to support them, you know, so that's, it's not even about the, the product being made in America. It's just about supporting those people that support you and doing, you know, good, making high quality stuff, making decent quality stuff. I mean, that's one thing about America is you just never know what the quality is going to be like. But a lot of times when it's your friends, at least you do know what the quality is going to be like. That could be, that could go in the other direction too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's kind of the thing is, it it really it really has to do with supporting my friends and not just being made in America kind of mm -hmm. thing. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, in the last, so you, you want to talk about what it's been like for the average bike shop in the last two years since the pandemic began? Did you? We of course we all know we've all heard read the headlines about how big bikes have gotten and and about how busy bike shops are and the supply chain shortages with doing builds and all the SRAM mumbo jumbo you know what's uh yeah what was that like for you guys um so in the beginning it was it was kind of fun mm -hmm. because we've never been busy like that before so it was like this is crazy you know we were like <laughs> what we were we were having like twenty thousand dollar days mm -hmm. on the regular you know it was yeah, just like yeah. that's never happened you know i i mean i can count on my hands before the pandemic $10,000 days at GSE, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, so that was, that was kind of crazy, but you know, I would give up that boom any day to, to have had the relationships I had with my employees before that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really, it really got hard to work in a bike shop after that, after the supply chain, well, after the boom, because when the boom was going, 
it was great for us because we carried smaller brands. Nobody was touching them. You know, mm -hmm. I probably sold a hundred salsa journeymen, a hundred in like three months, a hundred because <laughs> nobody wanted a salsa journeyman, you know, like all these specializers are sold out, all these treks are sold out, but man, specialized journeyman, sold a hundred of them. I'm, so, I'm sorry, everybody who's, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's the thing, like, you know, so we had a, we had a really great run, um, but during this run, I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, um, but we, my wife and I had an extremely rare thing happen and she ended up going on bed rest in a hospital um, for almost two months. And obviously during those two months, I was not at the bike shop. Um, I was at the hospital when I could be in most days. Um, and that was kind of like when things started to run out. So like we started mm -hmm. to lose product. We started to build started to take over a year to do and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and that's when things got really hard and relationships really started to suffer at the bike shop. I don't know. I don't know what just happened, but I just found something. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> You're YouTube famous. <laughs> uh, that's it. There's, there's probably so many people it. mad at me that my baby's face is on the internet right now. But... <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go back. Scanning eyes. How did you right get a now? cupcake without taking a nap? Anyway. <laughs> um. So the the two years after that boom were horrifying. Hmm. I mean, be it you know, it used to take a month to build a custom bike, and then all of a sudden, I mean, there was one Starling that we built that I think took a year and a half to like. Dang. You know, you could have cut corners and done some other things, but you know, if you wanted, if you wanted to build the bike how you wanted to build the bike, like it was just, it was crazy. Hmm. You know, and it, right as GSC was closing, things started to normalize a little bit. Um, but it was not fun building complete, building custom bikes was was really not fun for like a year and a half. That used how, to be like that used to be the most fun you could have. It, how how understanding were your customers? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, luckily, Golden South Cyclery had some of the best customers in the world, and most of them were extremely understanding. Um, and those ones that weren't understanding, they got vibed out, as Ryan. Said. <laughs> <laughs> <got vibed> out. <laughs> You know, that was one thing. If you wanted us to do this thing for you, you know, you had to have an understanding of what we were going through, too. And, you know, that was one thing is I don't think I don't think people will ever understand what it was like to work during the pandemic. You know, the, for the people that did not work it, even at a bike shop, you know, obviously we're not first responders. We're not, you know, doctors or nurses. But the shit that we had to deal with from people and the ideas that we had to like kind of figure out what was going on because, you know, the whole our government wasn't giving us the information we needed to know. We thought we were going to die every day. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy had like a heart attack almost every night, you know, because he's like someone coughed. I'm like. You know, we didn't know. We didn't know right. what was going on. And mm -hmm. I mean, it was just miserable. Mm -hmm. It was it was miserable. Coming out of that, uh, you hear headline, you read about, right, you know, bike shops uh, and that, had, that felt that initial um, those boom days in the beginning there. And thinking of how what the last bike boom that we had in the 70s lasted a decade. Right. And I think yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people were, were buying in ways that, I don't know, um, kind of assuming that that was going to be the case this round also. I don't, this, I don't think we were buying thinking the boom was going to still be a thing. Mm -hmm. I think we were told to buy because we didn't know when we could get anything ever again. Yeah. I mean, was, so many bike shops got so royally screwed ordering a hundred bikes just because they didn't know when they would ever get bikes again mm -hmm. a lot of people weren't ordering more 
than they normally would have. They were just ordering that amount in one go. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was a nightmare. People, I mean, I know bike shop owners who were buying storage containers to put bikes in their parking lots. And, you know, and now all those bikes are just sitting there. You know, mm -hmm. all these bike brands, everything's gone on sale because they just, there was so much stuff left these over. Sale, these sales in, uh, leading up to the holidays were, I mean, everything was on sale. It was like, it was that's a scary that's a scary sight that always gives me anxiety when i'm yeah. seeing that much stuff on sale and you're just like what are you oh my god yeah. like 50 percent off like <laughs> <laughs> that is but that is also one thing i learned in the later days of golden south psych 3 we in the history of golden south psych 3 we never had a sale until we closed mm -hmm. um and that's you shouldn't do that you, you should, should you, you should you put should things have, on sale. You should have sales. I don't know, Kai. I've always thought that instead of putting when, my stuff on sale, I'd burn it first. Man, <laughs> when, <laughs> when stuff is sitting, it needs to go because it's costing you money. Holding it, cleaning it, storing it, it's got to go. Um, that was one thing I did learn, and that's just a part of organization. You can't be organized if you're sitting on old inventory. Mm -hmm. I mean, someday. Ronnie, you're not going to sell out of bags. Oh, and you're going to have to figure something out. I've been burning them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think we're keeping warm during this chat? That's, that's, that's why there's side. two fireplaces. That's why there's two fireplaces. <laughs> I'm burning bags, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Tire fires everywhere, burning bags. It's, it's a real, it's a real apocalypse over here. But I'm warm, you know. <laughs> It smells good. All the all the oh, leather. Yeah, yeah. All the leather yeah. <laughs> great. Warm. I still yeah, people still think I'm successful. You know, I got it. Win win. <laughs> that is another thing. Is I mean, Golden South Cyclery was such smoke and mirrors. You know it. Obviously, obviously we were successful because everybody you know was getting a paycheck. You know, but in terms of business, we were the least successful business ever. You know. It, it just that's another thing is like you can be you can be popular you can be supported by your community and it's still not enough in the bike industry the margins are just too low and there's just too much going on you know to to get get the customers to buy everything from you you know so say like so say if we took away the blank check that russ was going to write you um it, uh and you had to start a bike shop over again. <clears throat> I guess we haven't really gotten into this. Uh, I guess first we could ask this afterwards, but would you, I don't know if you are starting another bike shop. That was my question, but the, you know, is it, is it financially viable to open a bike shop? Is it a good idea or is it something that you always got to do for the passion anyway? To be honest, I think it, it's definitely something you always have to do for the passion. Um, Cause you're never going to make a lot of money. But also, I don't know. I don't feel like I, I, I don't need a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, I just need to make sure, uh, you know, my wife and my daughter are happy. I need to make sure that, you know, the mortgage gets paid. You know, I, especially if you're good at riding bikes, a lot of times people give you bike stuff, you know, so like I don't have to worry about that. Luckily, you know, a lot of times I can get bike stuff for myself to ride. Um, but like, yeah, if you want if you want to open a bike shop to make money. Like, no, like that's the only <laughs> thing I've ever heard. You know, there's that saying in the bike industry. It's like the quickest way to make a million dollars in the bike industry is start with 2 million, you know, because you, you're going to lose, you're going to lose a million, no doubt about it, but you may come out with a million dollars, you know, but mm -hmm. you've already lost a million. So that that's pointless. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's really, it's really difficult with the margins, you know, and that's another thing about having your own branded stuff is you're controlling the margins and, you know, you can get the margins to an area that, you know, makes sense and, mm -hmm. you know, can pay for the person that made it, pay for the person that packs it, pay for the person that designed it and still pay for a little bit of rent after that too. Mm -hmm. You know, but we're, um, we're, which had the biggest margins, the products or the services? Uh, I mean, services obviously look like they have the biggest margin. Um, but once you're paying a mechanic, a, a decent amount, um, our service prices were way too low. That's 
a hundred percent I'm positive of that. Um, so services were not a huge margin or a moneymaker for us. Um, we did a lot of service, you know, and it paid for everybody in the back, but I, I wouldn't say it ever really made the bike shop any money. Mm -hmm. You know, really the, the thing that made golden Saddle psych three, the money was having the products that you can't get online, mm -hmm. you know, it really was. I mean, we sold so much Paul components, so <laughs> much, you know, and that that made me so happy because uh, I absolutely love everyone there um, and just stuff like that. You know, like the thing is, people want to see they want to see a two hundred dollar break before they buy a two hundred dollar break. You know, so <laughs> like, got it. If you if you have the means to have a two hundred dollar break in your store. I, I promise it, it will sell eventually. Yeah, yeah. And if it doesn't, you know, just blame me. <laughs> <laughs> I got a shipping container of Paul stuff out back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I guess your question is, um, am I opening another bike shop? And mm -hmm. the answer is obviously yes, because that I don't know if I know I've been doing this for too long. Like, I don't know if I know anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I went to school for photography and film, um, which is also another reason why, you know, GSC is so visual. But, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I, I just don't know if I could do anything else. I don't know if I could. I, I don't know if I could work in the cycling industry in general because I think it's so fucked up. And mm -hmm. I absolutely can't stand most of the brands out there um our friends but, lose their jobs every day in the bike in the greater bike industry it's, well that's it's the, chaos. that is the thing is because <laughs> you know the the bike industry is j crew they're culture vultures they're mm -hmm. they're going to see what is great from these independent businesses brands bike shops and they're going to take that person you know mm -hmm. ultimately that person's going to get paid too much money and they're going to be fired for someone younger um, but that one thing I will say is if you quit listening to the youth in a bike shop, you will go out of business as well. You know, mm -hmm. young kids who ride bikes um, still are the heartbeat of this industry. And I hope I hope everyone realizes that wheelie kids are the most important thing the bike industry has ever seen. I've been saying this for many years and it, I feel like people are finally starting to take notice, but those kids are the future of the bike industry and it could be a bike industry that for the first time is fun and worth a damn. <laughs> we'll be dead. All of us will be dead. So but, are, you, are you opening up a wheelie shop? What's the, uh, what's I, would, the I mean, I would love to have a wheelie shop. Do you have any rear plans? wheels only? Yeah, rear <laughs> wheels only. That's right. Yeah. I should I should start making a tire for that, huh? There you go. <laughs> I'd be like a trainer, you know. You just make trainer. Yeah, yeah, tires. All right. Um, but no, uh, myself, Anna Maria, and Sean Wolf are opening a bike shop here in Los Angeles, California. Okay. Um, Anna Maria, and Sean, owners of Sun and Air, um, and King Cog in new york have moved to los angeles and uh yeah it is this all kind of happened right as we announced golden south golden south cycle was closing and you know they reached out to me and they were like you know maybe it's maybe it's time we you know do like a I, we've been talking about like doing a superstore forever you know like any any two bike shops that are amazing do something together, see what happens kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Sean and I both are from Indiana. Uh, so that's kind of wild that, a, you know, someone from Indiana owned this very, you know, popular bike shop in New York, me being from Indiana, owning a popular bike shop in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, Sean and I become very close because of, you know, just these similarities and yeah, you know, I love his family. His family loves my family. And yeah, we are going to try to open a bike shop that can support two actual families <laughs> and see if it'll work, you know? Mm -hmm. 
That's exciting. Like I've never yeah, been to Sun and Air, but I follow them on the gram and it's always looked like a, a really rad shop. Yeah. Someone just asked on here if I ever thought about selling frames from local builders. Um, yeah, that is, we sold more Larkin Dreamers than probably anyone um, because Darren was making bikes here in Los Angeles. Um, now, he's, he's now he's here. Now. <laughs> Ronnie now. He Come, come uh, to Connecticut. It's where. I but yeah, but yeah, you know, that's always been a thing. You know, that goes back to supporting your friends. Um, if you have friends that make bikes, you should sell them. Uh, period. Dot. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Cool. I'm trying to read these questions and answer them too. It's been a lot. But, been a lot of questions. I, yeah. Yeah. Let's. Uh, someone says they're 40 and still ride brakeless track bikes. <laughs> I definitely do that as well. I, I ride a brakeless track bike more than any other bike these days. Nice. Um, so we're at the hour mark, but let's uh, let's turn this to the comments. If you've got a, a, a comment or a question for, for Kyle or Ronnie or myself, throw it in there now so we can scroll down and see what's what's there. Um, That's right. I'm very lucky uh, to so have Frank the Welder locally also. Here, we large large of, ass, yeah, Kyle. Your best, what's your best all-time GSC in memory? <laughs> oh my i mean to to be I, I, there's so many um but before my wife was my wife she made <laughs> me this gsc nice. that's a good memory um and then second is is a bunch of memories um meeting jaime rosas is the is the greatest thing that ever happened to me with golden tails i agree uh, Jaime has become one of my best friends and to see him, you know, go from being a child to an adult over the last six years of him working at Golden Style Psych 3, um, has easily been the most outstanding memory that I can have from there. And that also encompasses like a million memories. So I feel pretty good <laughs> about that. Answer. Well, uh, so, um, we got one here from Dean. Do you have a, a part of Los Angeles that you guys are, are scoping out for the new shop? Van Nuys. We've, please say Van Nuys. <laughs> we've, we've actually, we've actually, we've put in applications at two locations in Glassell Park and have not been able, and we have been denied those locations. Um, that's kind of the area we're looking. Uh, we also are open to downtown. We, you know, obviously we're not going to be in, I, I don't know. Look, I have another visitor now. <laughs> like, how, do, how do these visitors keep seeing? Um, yeah, so we we don't have we don't have an area right now, um, but we're kind of looking from downtown to Glasgow Park area. Cool. I thought this was a good one. Uh, what's something different you would want to do? Um, I'm going to guess. Aside from organization, is there? <laughs> um, yeah, this can be organized. <laughs> and another thing is Galvin is one of GSC's oldest customers as well. Galvin was coming to GSC when he was a child, like child, child. Also doing ignorant things, but <laughs> turned out to be a great human being. Um, do differently. Support my friends more um be more organized um and the only thing i'm going to do differently at the new shop that we didn't do before was sell e-bikes mm -hmm. let's see turn if anybody from turn is listening <laughs> i want to make friends with you did did sun and air do a lot of e-bikes in in new york uh I think I, you, I just don't know. I don't know, but I, I'm guessing they did. Um, Sean and Emery have been supporters of e-bikes and having a family with e-bikes for a very long time now. So I don't see how they could not have. Right. Uh, I'd love, I wish so. If somebody in the comments will tell me what their favorite bike shop is on the East coast, I'd love to hear because I just don't feel you're saying sun and air. I, I've, I've been into King Kong, obviously. We really don't have anything out here. Devil's Gear, the greatest. Yep, we got, bike we've got Devil, we got Devil's Gear. We've got Devil's Gear. I'm just, does, I should does Matthew say Devil's is Matthew gear. still part of that? Yes, and no, I know I don't. He sold it completely to Johnny and Greg. Okay. Um, 
which is it's devil's gears of course is in new haven connecticut it is a great bike shop um yeah. i just started to think of like we used to have a bike shop in every single town on the shoreline where i grew up and they're all gone they're just all gone it's, it's, it's like everyone just got up and left and uh any kind of bicycle community that we have is all um kind of if i see somebody on the road and I, and they're riding a bike i yell at them and try to catch up and say hey meet over here and we're gonna ride there's just no, you think of all the places uh, that don't have these like community hubs and bike shops and things like that. I wonder if that can all change, but that's another conversation, isn't it? That is. Yeah. <laughs> and what are, I guess, what are some of your personal favorite bike shops, Kyle? Keystone in Philly. There we go. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, and walks good. Man, I, I love bike shops. I mean, I go on vacations, places because I want to visit bike shops um you know i got to go to boom boom bike room for the first time in santa barbara recently which looks oh, amazing <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Mine, mine was blown i mean it's unbelievable uh, i gotta uh, see that spot it it's so fantastic and also if you've never been to the bicycle stand in long beach absolutely unbelievable mm -hmm. um you know but then when you start thinking about like across the country I mean, there's just so many great shops, uh, you know, talking about Monkey Wrench, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, Ponderosa. I, mm -hmm. I mean, the list of good bike shops is is huge. But the problem is, you know, knowing that, knowing those bike shops. Um, God, where? I mean, I, those ones I said are are absolutely outstanding. Uh, mm -hmm. First time I went to Golden Pliers, my mind was kind of blown, too. It was kind <laughs> of it felt to me like a clean golden saddle cyclery, right. uh, <laughs> which is unbelievable. You know, I uh, did you go to <laughs> Ohio when you were in Ohio? Yes. I've been, to, I've been to the mod shop. He, he taught me how to bend my first handlebar. No bicycles of Ohio. <laughs> the mod shop. Oh, bicycles of Ohio. No. Yeah. I've Have been, you been to bicycles of Ohio? Yes, I, I met, um, I met long hair. Um, I'm forgetting his, I'm, I'm Tyler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's he used to work there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a cool shop. Unbelievable place. You know, mm -hmm. my you know, my buy my idea of a great bike shop most of the time is usually usually a grumpy man with too much shit in his space. <laughs> um but you know, there's so many great new bike shops. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Hope Cyclery bought a building recently. Um, I'm a huge believer in if you're a bike shop and you have the ability to buy a building, mm -hmm. you should because you will not be put in situations like mm -hmm. Golden Saddle Cyclery was. <laughs> uh, you know, angry we should also. to say if you're anywhere around <laughs> the pencil, anywhere in Pennsylvania, you should go to Just Hope Cyclery. Buy the building for go, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go to go to go, go to Johnstown and buy a building. They're like, <laughs> but then. <laughs> You know, Angry Catfish was able to buy a building in Minneapolis recently. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Palo Alto's uh, bicycles. Like, if you go there, like, they're, they're where they're at now, like, they bought their building early. Like, there's no way, like, a, a bike shop. You imagine buying a Palo Alto in. now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Durango Cyclery, you ever been mm -hmm. there? I mean, that's an unbelievable mm -hmm. bike shop. Mm -hmm. um, someone said Yop in Denver. Um, they really they really stepped up when Denver lost, you know, three great bike shops. Um, I mean, that's what the thing is. There are great bike shops across this country. And the thing is people don't realize it. And people, it's just like, cause everyone's so consumed with buying their thing the easiest way possible these days, you know? Um, and it, it pains me. But the thing is like, if you support your friends, you will eventually learn what all the good bike shops in this country are. Here you go, Kyle. <clears throat> well, we are, we are, we're definitely interested, Sean. And I <laughs> turn has been on the top of uh, my wife and I's list for family bike. Um, we, I, ha I was using a big easy um, Mauricio at GSC took over uh, the big easy to do a mobile bike repair, uh, business with. So I only have like a normal Kona e-bike right now. And we're really, tr we're really thinking about having another child and that turn, you know, it has all the boxes, unbelievable bikes. It seems like to me, I haven't ridden one personally, but they seem like unbelievable bikes. Yeah. 
Cool. Oh, Cub House. Cub House. Cub yeah. House. Cub House is impressive. <laughs> That's an yeah. impressive shop. Sean Sean Talkington has some of the best taste in the game. It's a. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean. It's the wine bar of bike shops. There's no mm -hmm. doubt. <laughs> if you want to go, that's why I like you it. Just, yeah. You don't want to get drunk, but you want to be there and you want to mm -hmm. feel good. Mm -hmm. You want to just, yeah, swish, swish around. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm glad that you've uh, you've kind of thrown it out there that you know support a good bike shop. Like I've mm -hmm. had uh, two bikes partially built, and um, I actually use Golden Plier for one in analog in the East Coast, and not used. Uh, some of the local shops just because I don't vibe well with them all the time, mm -hmm. but yeah, definitely supporting even remotely those, those cool shops. Yeah. And that's, that is, this is what I'm, I'm preaching now. Uh, you can't always support your local, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you have to, you have to seek out the person that brings you joy. Um, you know, the person that you, you sign on to that social media app to see what they're doing, you know, like, cause like, it's not like that's free, you know, like it costs money to take photos. It costs money to do these things. Um, so the thing is, we just got to really start supporting our friends and the people that support us. Uh, and that's just everything could get only marginally better for right now, but everything will start to get better if we are doing that, um, you know, because that's that's what society was originally. You know, you were supporting the people next to you, the people that supported you. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, shout out Topanga to Topanga Creek. Topanga Creek. Uh, uh, you bet. I've been, I've been supporting Topanga Creek since it was Hollywood Pro. Hollywood yeah. In Hollywood. Hollywood, Hollywood. <laughs> and that, to be honest, first time I walked into Hollywood Pro, and that's when I was at Orange 20. Um, I walked into Hollywood Pro, and the amount of stuff that they packed into that little shop. And it was also the first place I saw 20 Brooks at one time. And I was just like, <laughs> I was like, this is home. This is home for me. That's a good yeah. indicator. Yeah. 20 Brooks at one time. Yep. You're yeah. And to speak of Spanger Creek, they're saying you bet um, in Grass Valley. I mean, Jay was at Topanga Creek for years. Um, he left to open up you bet. And that is an unbelievable shop doing unbelievable things. Mm -hmm. cycle east russ yeah. is unbelievable mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know big shot i mean a shop that's grown so much over the years unbelievable mm -hmm. people are people know people are saying yeah. good shop there's no question. yeah there's a lot of good shops like that <laughs> yeah there's a lot <laughs> we've got smart viewers <laughs> yeah yeah very well <laughs> Nice to um, see. <laughs> so we're at like an hour 10 or hour 12. So I'm going to take us home here. Uh, but thanks Kyle for being on the live stream. Thanks everyone in the comment yeah. section for, for chiming in. Um, we've got 370 people in the live stream. That's and it stayed around 300, like the entire time. Yeah, so it's yeah, super that's impressive. Good. That's good. People like bike shops. This is a, this yeah, is a good, I mean, <laughs> it's a good indicator thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, thanks Kyle. You know, I best of I've luck always, on your next endeavor there. That's real exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to Thank see you what very it, much. it turns out to be. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it'll be great. I yeah. hope so. I really hope so. Cool. My cat is attacking me right now. <laughs> What's gonna Robert, be the, are, yeah? Are no. we gonna do this again? People people wanna know if this is gonna be a regular thing. <laughs> <laughs> you you and I, Russ, on these things, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, yeah, it's going to be a at least every what? How many times a week? How many times a month do we want to do this? At least, at least once twice. A month. I thought like twice like a two, month. Yeah, yeah, two days out of thirty is an okay mm -hmm. commitment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess it'd be. I, I wouldn't be able to do that, so I. I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool if anyone has ideas that they want things they want us to talk about or things they want to ask us. I guess you could put it in there too, and we could brainstorm about it later. But yeah, we should definitely do some more of these. These are fun. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll get some uh, more fireplaces. Night, more fireplaces the next fireplaces, time. We promise. Yeah. <laughs> before those get in the comments, we don't want to, you know. <laughs> Thanks, I got, bag, I got bags Ron. to burn. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. And, uh, Thank y'all. Good night. Have good a night. wonderful night. Surprise.